Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Duggan, and I'm speaking to you today from Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, where I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine. I want to talk to you today about creativity in a COVID world. But prior to my starting, I really want to thank the organizers of the ANSCA 2021 Melbourne Annual Scientific Meeting for inviting me today. I wish I was there, um, but uh, but this has just been an amazing conference in that it is immersive yet online, and the organizers have done a fantastic job to make everyone, I think, feel very included. Uh, this is a QR code for my talk. Uh, just uh, put your smartphone up. No need to take a picture of it. Uh, you can just put your smartphone up uh, with the camera on and it should download the PDF of this talk so you'll have all my references. This is MacGyver. And in the 80s, MacGyver was very popular in North America. He not only sported the best mullet ever, uh, but he also solved problems through his own ingenuity. He usually worked alone uh, and he got himself out of very tight corners and problems with uh, usually using uh, some uh, copper wire, maybe some dryer fluff that he found and some chewing gum. Uh, his genius combined with his awesome good looks would have made him a good anesthetist, but certainly made him a great superhero for a long time and also motivated us to coin the term MacGyver bias in 2019. Now, MacGyver bias is the, uh, the thought behind it is that when we create something ourselves, we are blinded to its deficits we tend to overlook its weaknesses and its possible failures because we have created it. And we all suffer from this. Um, usually uh, it, when it comes to emergency front of neck airway, this involves at least one three-way stop tap and other things such as uh, syringe barrels and uh, non-purpose made equipment. We were struck by the hundreds, literally hundreds of letters to the editor uh, suggesting different things that you could use to save a life in the middle of a can't ventilate, can't oxygenate situation, all with no evidence, all suggesting that they could be used. Uh, again, there's a certain MacGyver bias when you come up with something yourself. In March, 2020, Michael Ryan from uh, the UN in charge of emergency response said it best about the pandemic and how we should manage the pandemic, which is the problem in society we have at the moment is everyone is afraid of making a mistake. Everyone is afraid of the consequence of error, but the greatest error is not to move and the greatest error is to be paralyzed by the fear of failure. A hundred years on from our last world pandemic, medicine has moved on incredibly to the point that we are very failure we are very remiss to to move quickly because we don't want to fail and yet on the other hand we have to move quicker than our normal pace in medicine during a pandemic and Michael Ryan had it right. Uh, we saw the iceberg, but I don't think that any of us saw the depth of the iceberg that we're now witnessing heartbreakingly so in India and in other countries. Uh, Canada, no comparison to India whatsoever, but we are being hit hard with our third wave and the worst time of it. There's one thing that's for, for sure, COVID is going nowhere fast and we need to come up with ways to maintain our safety and the safety of the public and our patients. COVID-19 pandemic, the hardest hit in Ontario in my province is Toronto. And in fact, there must be a lot of people there that just can't help but think of the SARS epidemic in 2003 also hit Toronto hard. And in fact, in Ontario, 44% of people who got infected with SARS, which is a very close sister to COVID-19, were healthcare workers. This resulted after uh, 2003 of it occur when it occurred to that a SARS commission was set up headed by Justice Archie Campbell, 
who actually said communication with staff re reflect that should reflect a precautionary principle principle that is better to err on the side of caution when dealing with a little understood new disease. This was actually highlighted by Crosby and Crosby in a Canadian Journal of Anesthesia opinion article in 2020 talking about the need for a precautionary principle. And why is that? Why should we provide more PPE and perhaps quote unquote over PPE for healthcare providers? And it is for face validity. Healthcare providers need to know that they're being taken care of in a system overly taken care of rather than equivalent taken care of or undertaken care of. Uh, in order to maintain en engagement in their system and decrease burnout. And yet in March and April and May of 2020, we had a shortage of N95 or equivalent masks, and yet we were being asked to, uh, to work more and more hours, particularly in areas that were worst effective, such as New York City and Italy and the UK in London. Uh, and we were being asked to reuse our PPE days and sometimes weeks at a time. Certainly it caused a tremendous amount of stress levels and it's not like institutions and healthcare programs had a choice it, during that time. There was massive shortages worldwide leading to a scarcity mentality and competition between countries, uh, which is really unfortunate and actually stressed us out even more as frontline workers. We didn't know very much. This is a TRAN article, a systematic review from 2012 that got enormous bump in the number of people that was looking at it when COVID first started. It has now been cited by almost a thousand different articles since, the, since COVID began. Um, and really, this was all the information we had at the time, uh, you know, who, what healthcare workers get SARS, maybe we can apply it to COVID too. This is uh, just a famous now uh, image of a um, splatter pattern on a visor from, uh, from a cough uh, to a healthcare worker that was published in the New England Journal early in the pandemic and really went along with trans findings that tracheal intubation was associated of an odds ratio of 6.6 .6 compared to those healthcare workers not involved in tracheal intubation, which was the highest risk procedure of uh, healthcare workers that acquired SARS. The 95% confidence interval is wide because the, the, a lot of these studies were retrospective studies in this, uh, in this syst uh, systematic review with very few uh, patients, but you get the idea. Uh, you are more at risk when you are doing tracheal intubation procedures. So between the lack of PPE and the need to actually provide airway management, many people, many institutions from all over the world almost simultaneously started to create airway boxes, airway tents, uh, airway barriers in order to uh, protect themselves without adequate PPE and being so worried about getting infected. This was a natural extension, in my humble opinion, uh, to trying to protect us. Uh, and many, many of these were at, were um, advocated for on social media, in particular Twitter, um, really better than nothing. Without adequate PPE, with, with us not knowing very much about how it spread, really better than nothing uh, was the adage. And yet we found out very quickly that we were wrong. Uh, in these two articles, which are landmark articles, in my opinion, uh, coming out of anesthesia and both of them coming out of Australia. Well done, Australia. Um, both the quantification of airborne particles by Simpson and Peter Chan et al. And then looking at the aerosol box for its effect on airway management by Begley and Brewster et al. Uh, both of these combined showed that um, you prolonged your intubation attempts, you had to repeat them, it was associated with laceration of PPE, and it actually was associated, these intubation boxes were associated with an increase, not a decrease in exposure, as the, these boxes concentrated aerosols and then shot them out the armholes right into the face and chest of the intubator. This resulted in the intubation boxes being a failure. 
but they weren't a whole failure. The intubation boxes weren't a failure because they made us move. They made us start to think about aerosols and how we should manage them. They started making us think about other things that were involved in how we actually uh, interact with our environment um, and how we should go about looking at such inventions. So Begley said it best uh, very succinctly in a, in a tweet, does it work? Is it safe for patients and staff? And does it meet regulatory standards? You can't just go off and start trying things on patients without a process, uh, regulatory process. We also, what we didn't appreciate at the time when we invented the airway boxes was the fact that other people had gone before us, engineers, bio, biomechanical engineers, uh, ma mathematicians, a tremendous number of people have looked at the dynamics in operating rooms, ICUs and hospitals and emergency rooms, looking at air turnover per hour. How do you dissipate both droplets and airborne potential infections? How do you provide laminar flow? What are the effects of uh, laminar flow like above the picture above? What are the effects of a door opening, such as the picture below? Different sizes of operators, of surgeons, of anesthetists. Where should you put different equipment? All of these play a role in how air turns over in the room. And it gave us also, the intubation boxes gave us uh, uh, an invitation to start really looking at our own air changes per hour in our ORs and in our other environments. You know, how exactly are these things working? Because what happened was the airway box, which we thought would work, actually thwarted very good evidence based um, air circulation in our hospitals. The other thing that we did not understand is that there is real science around how droplets and airborne particles are spread. Uh, Lydia Berubia has studied this for over 20 years. She has over 1,200 publications about mathematical modeling out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And here are some of her images looking at how infections spread from respiratory droplets and airborne particles. The first was a wet cough. This is a dry cough. And what you're about to see is a sneeze. All of these can last a long time in the air. They all spread in different ways. A forceful sneeze is a cloud which can last for a long time in the air and which can travel 25 feet. These are the mathematicians um, and the modelers that we need to be engaged as clinicians before we start thinking that what we can think of as common sense may not be common sense to, to actually the pure scientists. We definitely do need to engage the inventors though, when New York City started to look at the possibility of ventilating more than one person per ventilator, how does that happen? How do we do that safely? A lot of those ideas did not come to fruition because we need some sort of structure uh, in order to assess these possible inventions uh, during, during the pandemic. We published this thinking outside the acrylic box as a more formal way of, of stating what Begley uh, also said, uh, which is the defining of the problem and to make sure that it's safe before it uh, makes sure that it's effective. You just got to make sure it doesn't cause harm first. Um, all of these take time. Each step takes time and it is a snakes and ladders of how to actually get something um, that is eff effective and not harmful onto, uh, onto clinical work in order to see whether it succeeds or not. Nobody knows this more than Archie Brain, who arguably has saved more lives in modern anesthesia than anyone else. Uh, and he has done over 30 years of iterations of the laryngeal mask airway, 70 of them in three years when it initially um, was starting to be experimented on. Just amazing, amazing dedication and work. But a 30 year timeline is not going to work during a pandemic. 
So how do we balance this? How do we balance safety against um, the, uh, the evidence? How do we balance safety against uh, the, the risk of harm? How do we balance safety against the need for a, a timeline? Uh, that is the big question right now. And can we do it? Can we be swift and can we be evidence-based? And the answer is absolutely we can. We absolutely can. We need to start breaking down silos. We need to start seeing medical research not as a competition, but as a collaboration. We have to start breaking down silos between basic scientists and clinicians in order to have the most effective studies happen at, in, in the rapidity that we need right now. We need to start working together in different specialties in medicine in order to collaborate together. And we need to engage the citizen scientists. We need to engage frontline workers who believe that they are not researchers in order to collect data in order to to get their opinions on things on a massive scale in order to assess what's working what's not working and why and we are starting to see the fruits of this labor uh, we are starting to see the intubate covid group uh, headed by Danny Wong and Karim el Borgadli, who are doing an amazing job looking at the risk of healthcare workers when they are doing airway management. And what did they find? They found that PPE didn't fit women as well. Um, anesthesiology just published last week ahead of print, uh, emergency airway management in patients with COVID. How does PPE affect how we can actually deal with patients and number, number of attempts and how long it takes? and the effects uh, of patients. This is all amazing, amazing work because that literally thousands of front uh, line workers have agreed to input data for these, uh, for these researchers and in order to, to participate in this wide ranging work and that way we can do things quickly. Uh, just a special shout out to the COVID Surgical Collaborative again, you know, tens of thousands of people inputting data in order to participate in research uh, that will help us uh, figure out what best way to manage patients during this pandemic. In conclusion, uh, again, I wanna thank the organizers, but I wanna, I wanna say this, we have the connectivity already. We had it before this pandemic started. It's up to us as citizen scientists to organize ourselves, come up with good questions, patient-based questions, health care-based questions, public health questions in order to answer them. We, we owe it to ourselves and owe it to others to actually share our data and share our knowledge and share our experiences and collate them and publish them as free online sources to others actually share our databases so other people can access them. We, it, the time for medical research being siloed is over and the time to start truly collaborating in the thousands and 10,000s to come up with answers to these very important life-saving questions is now. Thank you for your time and have a good rest of your conference.